Okay, as we get started here in this um, main room breakout session, I'm Nancy Beers. I'll be your moderator for the program. I'm the um, president of the Virginia Native Plant Society, so I have quite an interest in native plants here. Um, for one thing, we'd like everybody to stay muted. I think you've been muted as you stayed in this room, so stay on mute. Put your questions in the chat box, if you would, and we will field them at the end of the program. Um, also, this is being recorded, so it will be visible. I mean, it will be posted or sent to you all later. So um, another thing that I found very helpful when I watch Zoom sessions is if a screen comes up that has a lot of information that I'd like to jot down, I usually hit my little print screen button so that I get a screen print of it. And that's very helpful to me later on. Um, is everyone ready to go? I think we have 161 participants in the room. So that's a very good indication of interest here. So I will introduce our speaker today. We're very pleased to have Alyssa Mira. She is president of Native Plant Landscape Design Corporation, a Falls Church Virginia landscape design firm specializing in the ecologically friendly use of native plants. Alyssa was born in the Dominican Republic. In 1997, she emigrated to the United States. From 2000 to 2010, Alyssa accompanied her Foreign Service husband and their two children to three different posts in Europe, Azores Island in Portugal, also London and Rome. While in the Azores, she became fascinated with the diverse fauna of that archipelago. While in London, she completed an intense program in garden design at the world famous Inchbald School of Design. In Rome, she completed an internship with a major garden firm and began her career as a professional garden designer. Returning to Northern Virginia in 2010, Alyssa created Native Plant Landscape Design, which has helped hundreds of homeowners create native plant gardens that are ecologically sustainable and that support all elements of the ecosystem. Alyssa frequently speaks to garden clubs in the Washington Metro area. She's received prestigious awards from both Fairfax County and from the Commonwealth of Virginia. Please welcome Alyssa Mira. Take it away, uh, Alyssa. All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I must say it was written by my husband. So <laughs> <laughs> um, let uh, me share my presentation and let me know that you can see it. Yes, it's amazing. okay. Great. Thank you. So I am very, very happy to be here. Um, thank you so much, um, Nancy, for inviting me. Um, the only thing that I'm regretting is that we cannot be in the in the same room, which you know I I love to you know share information and interact with people. But you know, hopefully next year we're going to be able um, to go back to do um, these kind of things. So as Nancy uh, mentioned, I worked for Native Plant Landscape Design. Um, we are based in Falls Church, and our work is um, designing and creating um, gardens that are sustainable, right? Gardens that for the most part are composed of um, native plants. Um, I'm going to um, do the first part of the presentation. I will focus on the site assessment and my colleague um, Alex Thompson will um, talk about um, the design process. That will be a presentation at 11 um, o'clock in one hour. Okay. So um, site assessment, um, assessing the conditions of your yard is maybe the most important step you can do before you plan a garden. Um, and the better you assess it um, goes directly um, in direct relation with the success of the garden. Um, I am a trained um, landscape designer, but my number one passion is gardening, right? So I can relate to many of you when you go to a garden center and you discover this new beautiful plant and you bring this plant, uh, you know, to your garden and you think you have the perfect spot for this plant and then 
this is what happens, right? You know, after a few weeks or after a few months, um, the plant is start wilting, it turns um, brown, or maybe it gets too big for the space and it looks so little in the, in the nursery and you have to start uh, pruning it, it three times a year, right? That, that is very common. Um, so all the plants that we see in a garden center in their real life, they are plants that come from a natural habitat. Even what we consider indoor plants, they live happily outdoor somewhere in the Caribbean or somewhere in a tropical forest in South America. Sometimes this is hard to believe. This is a picture that was taken in the Bay of Samana in the Dominican Republic in one of our vacations, vacation home about um, two years ago. So the winning formula when you are planning your garden is to assess the conditions very carefully, right? And then try and match the um, needs of the plants to the conditions that you have in your garden. Um, you have to look at the conditions and you have to match the conditions to um, what, you know, to what kind of natural habitat it resembles the most, right? Um, so remember that also, you know, there are different kinds of plant habitats and we're going to talk a little bit about the different kind of plant habitats that we can find in, in our areas, but plants are also somehow flexible. They, you know, they, they are not very rigid. Like for example, plants that live in a woodland, you know, they can tolerate um, a, you know, maybe a little bit of sun or maybe plants that, you know, can tolerate a dry conditions can also live in moist conditions. And in nature, there are many regions that are also transitional regions, right? The area, for example, in between a woodland garden and a meadow garden. And these natural areas of transitions are called equal tones. So, and many of our native plants are adapted to live in these eco tones. So when you are also planning and you are trying to match your conditions with the conditions of a natural habitat that you think it resembles, just be flexible, right? Just know that plants are flexible too. This is a garden that we installed about maybe two and a half years ago. It is a wonderful client that had a new construction in Lorton, Virginia. And most of the perennials in this garden were plug size. So they were about maybe two inches or three inches um, tall. And this is these pictures were taken just last fall. So you can see how fast um, these plants have um, evolved because they were actually happy in those conditions. Um, so, um, habitats um, and different communities. So I'm going to simplify it and I'm going to talk just about three different habitats that we can find in our area. Um, that is before we go into the, uh, you know, sort of um, site assessment part of the presentation. Um, so the first habitat, actually, sorry, the first, oops. Sorry, the first habitat that we're going to talk is the meadow habitat. It is a habitat that is for the most part open. It has, uh, it's very exposed to sun, so it has full sun. It is composed mostly by grasses and herbaceous. And in this habitat, um, in, in our area, for the most part, doesn't occur naturally. They need to be maintained artificially, either by mowing or sometimes by fire, right? Within the meadow habitat, you can have um, meadows that are very well drained, so are mostly composed by soils that are dry or maybe moist, but with soils that are very well drained, or you can have meadows 
that have soils that don't drain drain very well. So these are um, meadows that have wet, you know, wet meadows, are, they are called. The second habitat that I want to mention, sorry, I'm a little distracted because it's not, this slide is not working the way it usually works. But anyways, the second um, habitat that I want to talk about is the edge of the woodland or the edge of the forest. Um, in this habitat, um, usually we get well-drained soils and we get um, light shade and sometimes full shade. The woodland edge habitat is usually the habitat that we, um, you know, the kind of habitat that we encounter. Not in the right room. I, I can't move them. Oh, sorry. Um, any, anyways, the the woodland, the edge of the woodland habitat is the habitat that we usually encounter more often when we go and visit clients. Many of our um, projects back to a natural area. Not only that, because also the existing conditions in residential, residential landscapes, either in urban or suburban areas, the conditions, you know, that you have like partial shade, existing structure that would give shade like fences and tall walls. These habitats resemble the habitat of an edge of the woodland um, habitat. Um, if you, let me see if it works. If you, like, for example, happen to live in a yard that backs to a natural area, or if your yard has many existing plants that you can identify as native plants, um, you could possibly see what kind of habitat naturally grows in your neighborhood. And you can find out what kind of plant community is happy in the habitat and try to just get plants from that plant community. And that would be a way to make sure that your um, plants are going to be happy. And we're going to talk about this in more detail. I know it could be a little bit um, confusing. Um, the other habitat that we are going to talk about is the riparian habitat, which is a community that you know is um, is is habitat is a usually places that are close to the water's edge. This habitat is composed by plant communities that stabilized banks. And they do that by slowing the storm water runoff. Usually in this habitat, the water drains very slowly. It might be close to, uh, you know, to the canopy of existing mature trees. And it, for the most part, it's a habitat that has partial sun or partial um, shade. And obviously the soils are wet or um, very moist. So let's start talking a little bit about um, how to assess the oops, sorry, the conditions of your uh, of your sort of residential yard. There is a formula that we all learn in training uh, while we are in training, which says the right plant in the right place, and. Um, um, and, you know, I always say that they are, there are not people that have um, green thumbs. There are just gardeners that get to know the conditions of their yard very intimately and match those conditions with the plan um, needs. Um, it's kind of tricky to assess the conditions of a residential yard because unlike open natural areas, the conditions of a residential yard sometimes is limited by structures, by fences, by um, downspouts that drain in a, you know, in a particular area and so on. Um, for example, um, you can see here how you have a tall, um, you know, wall of the house and you have a fence and even though the area beyond the fence might be full sun and it might be an area that is south facing, you just have to take into consideration um, the shadow that is cast 
by this existing structure. Or for example, you could have a, an area that is south facing, but then you have a very mature um, you know, oak tree. So um, even though that area right in front of it, so that area that um, faces south, even though you can you know, think that it's an area that will be full sun, you have this you know, tree that casts the shadow and um, has a lot of root competition. Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, another thing that we take into consideration is the new constructions or um, houses that have had um, a renovation done. Usually in these kind of conditions, we find that we have very compacted soils and sometimes we have a lot of debris and things. So if you just move to a newly um, built is something that you have to take into consideration. Um, then um, before you start planning your garden, these are the questions that you can um, start thinking about. Um, we usually do this in the first meeting that we have and with our clients. We walk the property and we try to get every corner of the of the property of the yard as as you know as well as we can. Um, the time that we invest in getting to know the site will directly correlate on how successful and how happy um, the garden will be. So one of the first questions that I, you know, that I ask, and one of the first things that I have to pay attention is invasive plants is, I would say in our area is the number one um, problem that we have. And it is quite, um, it is quite a problem, right? So before you start um, thinking about going to the nursery and adding native plant, walk your yard. Maybe you can use one of those apps that can ID plants and try to identify all of this invasive. The invasive plant problem is so severe in our area that it's starting to change the ecology of some of our natural areas. And the worst part of this problem is that these plants for the most part come from our um, residential gardens. Um, I, I always say this is the, you know, we are usually flexible when we, we get the briefing from our clients about their style and what they want to have um, in their garden. But this is an issue that I have um, no compassion or any, you know, flexibility. And I will encourage you if you have a, any invasive plant that you can identify, I've removed them today or tomorrow, and we need to stop buying them. I assure you that there is a alternative native plant that can do exactly the same thing that your invasive um, does. Many people have these plants and they don't you know, they don't know. So as I say, try to identify and try to identify if it's an invasive plant. Um, the, you know, here I am just, um, I am just, um, you know, uh, mentioning a few. We could spend pretty much, you know, the whole day talking about them. Butterf you know, butterfly bush is a popular one. And people sometimes tell me, oh, but it attracts so many butterflies. Uh, no, but it's, a, it's one of the worst invasive. Mahonia, Nandina domestica, which is so popular as well. Not only uh, that, not only that Dina Dominica, Domestica has shown to be invasive, but the berries of the Nandina Domestica have a chemical called cyanide that can actually poison birds. Uh, barberry, Rosa multiflora, um, English ivy, uh, vinca, Japanese steel grass. Sometimes the problem of the invasive plant is so severe that we for, before we um, try and think about a design or an installation, we recommend our clients to um, consult with a professional invasive control um, company. There are 
resources that you can find for free in the internet. For example, this booklet from the um, National Park Services and this other, other booklet from the um, United States Department of Agriculture. So the second thing that we look at is how much light the area that you are planting gets. And what I mean, you know, how much sunlight it gets, um, you know, you have to take into consideration, for example, that the sunlight that you get in the morning is not the same sunlight that you get in the afternoon, right? So the client can tell me, oh, I get about, you know, four hours of sunlight, but this sunlight is from eight o'clock in the morning until noon, right? So it's not the same, a planting bed that gets morning sunlight of a planting bed that get the sunlight from like two o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock in the afternoon. Another thing that we encounter that is very common is people that tell us, oh, I have an area that is very dark, it's very shaded, and I don't know what to plant. So let me tell you, I have good news for you. Um, we have a wide a range of native and many of them live very happily in, in areas um, that are heavy wooded, therefore are adapted to, for example, be planted in front of a wall that is north facing and they would do very happy. And um, native plants that are for shade or you know, edge of the woodland or woodland combinations are very beautiful. They are very green and they have a lot of texture. And, um, and, you know, the, usually for the most part, they flower in the early spring. So that's um, something to take into consideration. Um, also, when you are assessing um, the yard, um, as I mentioned before, look at the structure. This is a project. Um, this, this was when I was doing the assessment. This is um, a, a house in McLean. Our client's house is the house to the right. And if you see um, the orientation, like for example, my client's house, that is the house with the gray wall, it was west facing. So this was the afternoon. So the planting bed that we were doing adjacent to that wall would get afternoon sun. But if I were to be designing a planting plan on the neighbor's side, it would be a, you know, a, a planting combination for, for shade conditions. So you can see in an area that is so close how you would have to do two completely different um, combinations of plants from very different plant communities, if that makes sense. Um, the other important thing to take into consideration, obviously, is the moisture of your soil in your property. Um, walk um, every little bit of your garden, um, take note or where you have a standing water, um, take note of areas that are very dry. Usually the areas that are upland tend to be drier and the areas that are um, downland are, um, you know, are more moist as well. Um, there are things that can affect the moisture of the garden. For example, there are existing structures, um, you know, sometimes retaining walls. Sometimes there are change in the grading within a yard that, you know, don't allow the water to move freely. I mentioned compaction is, a, is another one. Uh, there are things that you could do to improve the you know, soil permeability before you do the planting. Um, something like air spade or adding organic materials. Um, there are other factors that sometimes are a little more difficult to identify. Um, like for example, this picture I took in one of our clients um, yard in Alexandria, Virginia. And what happened here, the water just came from um, the water table that you know is an area 
that the water table in that area is very much in the surface. So we had a few weeks of a lot of rain. So all the water was coming um, from below. So we couldn't, you know, we couldn't, you know, we didn't know why the plants were dying, you know, some of the plants. And then I had one of the guys just dig a hole. And, you know, this is what we discover. Um, a trick that we sometimes do before we want to select a planting combination is a percolation test. And a percolation test is something very easy that you could do, which means you just dig a hole in the ground, which is maybe a foot or a foot and a half in depth, and you fill it with water. And then you observe it and you, you see how fast or how slow the water um, percolates. And that will tell you a lot about your site. This is usually something that we do when we are planning a rain garden. Um, or like, for example, when we are planning a, a sponge garden and a, a sponge garden is just an area that, you know, that we plan to have a conservation landscape to receive the, the water from, you know, the extension of downspouts or the water that comes from higher areas of the property. Another thing that you have to take in consideration is the water that comes from your neighbor's property. That is another thing, like maybe 60% of the time or 70% of the time of yards that I find that, you know, have a problem with um, flooding or water that doesn't move. The water comes from, um, from the neighbor's downspout or the neighbor's property is higher in elevation and so on. So things to, to, to think about. Okay, let's see. Um, the other thing that we look at is the um, characteristics of the soil. Um, you know, what is the content of clay? What is the pH? Um, in, you know, in certain ways, we, you know, we, when we are doing obviously a, a professional design, we recommend the clients to have a soil test done. It's a very easy thing to have done. There are many companies that do it, um, very, you know, for a very um, low fee. You can also have a soil test done through your uh, master gardeners organization, right? In general, I must say, working with native plants, um, we, you know, for the most part, we are very su self successful just trying to find a community that grows naturally in the area without having to do a soil test. Although a soil test can tell you a lot about, about your soils. There are some native plants that prefer certain kind of pH, um, like for example, the mountain laurel, the rhododendrons, the azaleas, um, they love a little lower pH. Um, or for example, the green and gold tends to like a little bit of a more alkaline. So sometimes it's helpful. Or if you're planning a vegetable garden, it's important to also know um, the pH or, you know, the nutrients level, and then you can adjust that. But for native, you know, to plant native, we, um, we never um, change the composition of the soils because, you know, that would be working against what we want to do. Uh, there is a website, it's the Web Soil Survey, which I recommend. In this website, you can type your address. And there, there are certain steps that you can go through and they have all the explanations of the steps that you, um, you know, how you do it, but you get a lot of information without having to do a soil test. Like for example, this I just did yesterday to show you and where you see that 104C, that is my house. And what that tells me is that my soil category is the 104C and on the right, you can see all of the different um, characteristics of my soil. I know for a beginner, all of these different kinds of things could be a little confusing, but there is a lot of information out there in the internet and it's a way for you to learn a lot about your site. Another thing when you're walking your yard is, um, 
take into consideration these slopes. Um, we have somebody from the company that does the initial survey for us, and we usually ask him to let us know where the beginning of the slope is and where the end of the slope is. Um, the plant palette that we use for an area that is leveled is not the same plant palette that we use for a sloped. Um, we have a problem in this area, which is that many of our clients try to grow um, turf or lawn in areas that are very sloped or in areas that are sloped and are very shaded. Um, so naturally the loan doesn't do very well and um, it has a very shallow root system. So what happens is that um, soon the turf or the sod fails and the, you get a lot of storm water runoff and you get a lot of erosion. So every year they lose, you know, maybe half an inch of um, topsoil. So um, these areas, um, for the most part, um, we, we, you know, we do the cleaning. We usually use a, um, a biodegradable um, fabric that is made out of coconut fabric called jute netting before we do the planting to hold the ground. And then we choose native plants that have a very deep root system. And, you know, just if something that you want to remember, you know, sedges, for example, which are cold season grasses, or for example, if you have a slope that uh, faces um, south and it has full sun, you can use warm season grasses as well. They have a very deep root system. But here in this illustration, you can see how the non-native plants have a very shallow root system and how some of the native plants have a very deep root system. Now, a word of caution. Not every native plant has a very um, deep root system. So um, do your homework. And um, the picture to the left is kind of a screenshot of my worst nightmare <laughs> because you have a deer with a background of English ivy. And wildlife is another one of the considerations that we have to take before we plan our garden. Um, if your yard is exposed to a lot of deer or to a lot of rabbit, you know you're going to try to choose plants that are less susceptible to be browsed by deer. Um, I must say when the deer is very hungry, they can pretty much eat anything, but um, they are less likely to eat sedges. They are less likely to eat ferns. They are less likely to eat um, grasses or plants that have a certain smell that the leaf uh, have you know texture of that are thorny, like the plants from the mint family, the pycnanthemon, or or you know things like that. Uh, rabbits can be also a big problem. For example, we do a lot of projects in Arlington County, and we find that in Arlington County, maybe we don't you know in areas that are very urban, maybe we don't have a lot of deer, but we do have a lot of rabbits. There are also a lot of um, a organic treatments that you can find in, you know, in garden centers or online that are very effective. Um, not only you have to look down and at your soil and at the wildlife, but you need to look up and look at your power lines, right? Or some of the utility lines in some of our neighborhoods, you have the cable. Um, going above. You want to make sure that the plants or the trees that you plant on their utility or power lines, eventually when they get to be a mature tree, they won't interfere. Um, so you, you, know, you won't have to have um, the power company um, train them every year. So that's 
something very, very, very important. And that's something um, that we see very often. Um, another consideration is septic um, systems. If your residence is not connected to the, just to the public septic system and you have an independent septic system, you need to make sure that you know the location, not only of the tank, but also of the drain field. There are restrictions of plants that you can plant around the, uh, for example, the drain field, you cannot use or within 10 feet of the drain field. You cannot use um, trees or shrubs, shrubs that are very large, or you cannot, you know, we recommend not to use uh, plants that have a very deep root system. Uh, because um, they can interfere and they can go into the pipes and it's better to do a little bit of homework uh, rather than having to pay for very expensive um, repairs. Windows, you know, the windows or of your um, house, um, when you are taking into consideration the plants that you are planting close to windows, you have to, for example, is, is this a tree or a shrub that is very dense? Will it block the light coming into my dining room? Or it could be the opposite. It could be that you're planting a tree or a shrub to block a street that is very busy, or maybe to give you some privacy from the neighbor's backyard. And that not only goes for windows, but that also goes for certain areas of your garden that you are planting. Many gardens or many planting beds are not only, you know, planned to have a beautiful garden, but they are also functional, right? Not only we are doing something for, for wildlife to be pretty, but we are doing something because we need some privacy because that is the patio or the deck where we gather. Uh, well, I don't know if we are gathering too much now, but hopefully we will start gathering again next year. <laughs> um, but anyways, another thing to think about is hardscapes and um, impermeable surfaces, for example, um, driveways and sidewalks. Um, a, you have to take into consideration the heat that reflects from sidewalks. You have to take into consideration the runoff water that you get from these impermeable surfaces. Um, also, for example, people walk their dogs on sidewalks. So you have to choose plants that are very resilient. You have to choose plants that have a very deep root system. Another thing that happens in these areas is you have to do a snow treatment. Uh, for example, if you have to you know, do salt in the winter to deal with the ice or with the snow, you need to make sure that the plants that you do in these areas are okay with having um, salt um, you know, drain in, in, the, in the winter time. You have to think about the inhabitants who live with you. Do you have young children? Do you have pets? And I, full disclosure, this is my golden retriever that I just lost a few months ago. So I miss him terribly. But anyways, he had a very long, happy life and he was like a permanent feature in my garden. And um, you need to think about plants that can be toxic for pets. Um, for example, the mountain laurel, um, some of the milkweeds, although the milkweed is an amazing plant and I am not discouraging you from using it. But if you have a small children, you have to teach them not to touch the plant or, or you know, not to put the berries or certain, not to eat the berries from, for, from um, certain plants. Um, also, 
when you're planning your garden, um, think about how your dogs move. Like very often we have to leave a gap in between fence and planting because the dogs needs to run around, you know, on the side of the fence, barking at the neighbor's dog. Or sometimes now thinking about it, we have to leave what we call the mailman path, which is like sometimes mailmans, they move from front yard to front yard. So we have to think about leaving an open space to move think about the use that you're going to give the garden and based on that um, plan the shape of your of your planting bed uh, and let me see how we are with time many of us um, live in properties that are part of a resource protection area right um, a resource protection area, they are just vegetated areas along water bodies, things like lakes, as rivers, as streams. These are environmentally sensitive land. Um, there are regulations that you have to know before you think about developing these areas. Um, usually the counties, they in their website, they have maps that you can you know, access to. And if you suspect because you have a creek or a river or a body of water close by, um, that you can see which areas of your yard uh, belong to our resource protection area. Sometimes you cannot clear the existing vegetation. You need a, you know, your permit for that. Or for example, if you, you know, in the case of Fairfax County, I believe if you have a planting bed that you want to develop that is more than 3,500 square feet, um, you have to do it by area. So you have to, you know, remove the invasive plant, mulch, and then um, move, move on. Um, oops. Um, the other thing um, to take into consideration is HOAs, um, regulations of HOAs. Sometimes you cannot have a vegetable garden in the front yard. Sometimes they don't want very large trees. Sometimes you need to leave some loan and hopefully these things are changing and there is a little bit more flexibility. Um, there is this wonderful um, booklet um, that Earth Sangha, Earth Sangha is a wonderful um, um, nursery based in Springfield, Virginia. And uh, with this um, booklet, you, you know, what they have done if they have divided um, plants by different conditions, right? They explain the different habitats and they give you a combination of plants for every condition that could be very helpful. After you assess the conditions of your yard, you can go and you can see what plants grow in those conditions in this brochure. And then you can match the conditions with the plants. Um, if you want to know, for example, how high or how wide this plant is going to get, how many you are going to need, this is a brochure that is wonderful for beginners. I find myself using it still very often, and it will tell you also the kind of soil, the kind of moisture that uh, certain plant species um, require. Um, Plant, native plants for Northern Virginia from the organization Plant Nova Native is another wonderful resource. Their website also has a lot of interesting things. Um, it is all of these resources are for free in the website. You also have the digital atlas of the Virginia flora, which also can tell you which specific native plants are native to your neighborhood. So this is another great resource. This is an app also that I use very often. I have it in my in my phone and also tells you a lot of information about uh, what specific ecotypes. Um, so just to conclude this um, presentation, um, you know, we do this and we go beyond because obviously we do this to a professional level. Don't let all of this information discourage um, you. 
uh, know that when you bring native plants, um, you will bring uh, butterflies, you will bring bees, you will bring birds and all, all sort of beautiful things. This kind of gardens will give you a lot of satisfaction. Um, this, you know, this is the two views that I have from my studio. The, the first one is the, is when I look to my back, the window to the back, and the other one is my window to the left. Um, and I cannot tell you, you know, when I am working and I just stand up and look back and, you know, it's just so relaxing and so wonderful. Um, go for them. I wish you the best. Good luck and happy gardening. And I think we have a few minutes in case any of you have any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alyssa. That was very um, informative and very thorough as to all these different conditions we need to look at. Um, let's see, we have a few questions in here. One person asked about what kind of organic treatment do you recommend for rabbits? Um, there is, first of all, when you are doing your planting combination, um, think about the plants that you're going to choose, right? As I mentioned before, sages, uh, plants like the pycnanthemum, which are the local means, um, are less likely to be uh, eaten by, the, by rabbits. Also, uh, like for example, we know um, Cicirincium agustifolium or blue-eyed grass that grows in the sun and ferns, um, these kind of plants um, are, you know, tend to be left alone. Uh, there is a, an organic product that we use and we recommend. We don't have anything to do with this company, but we have found that it is very effective. It is called um, deer and rabbit out. And we usually uh, get it from, you know, online from Amazon. And what we do is we spray the garden, especially when it's a garden that is newly installed. We spray it every two weeks or so just to teach um, the rabbits or the deer that this is not an edible garden. And we have found that it is very, very effective. Alyssa, can you tell us the difference between the afternoon sun and the morning sun? Um, right. So the morning sun is, um, let's say, a lot weaker than the afternoon sun. Um, uh, the morning, you know, usually in morning sun, we are still able to plant uh, a planting combination for woodlands, like, for example, many ferns and many plants like the Jacob's Ladder or the green and gold or for example, the Pachyra aurea, they can live happily in full sun and in morning sun. The afternoon sun is the strongest um, sun. And is the, you know, when we get at least five hours of afternoon sun is what we consider an area of full sun. Four to, to you know, six hours of afternoon sun you know, you can go with plants that are within the meadow community, which are warm season grasses, uh, some of the milkweeds, the coreopsis, and, and things like that. I hope that makes it clear. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, is there anything you can do if your neighbor is redirecting their water into your yard? <laughs> Yes. So the first thing is I would recommend to have um, really good relations with the neighbors, <laughs> have open communication. Um, and I always say when you have a situation in your garden, like let's say a water problem, usually the problem is not one thing, right? Usually the problem is a combination of problems, right? Not only you have a compacted soils, but you get the, you know, the neighbor's uh, water and, you know, you have a new development that just happened a block from your house and they took down 50 mature beautiful oaks and now all the water that used to percolate in that area comes running down right so I always say until we all change and we all start looking at our yards as part of the major ecosystem there won't be a you know a hundred percent solution right but let's say you don't talk to your neighbors and you don't know um, who they are or whatever um, 
probably you can identify the area where exactly the water comes from. And then in that area, you can maybe do an infiltration trench. And maybe in front of the infiltration trench, you can have a sponge garden, which is pretty much, as I mentioned before, a conservation landscape that is designed to receive a lot of water. And then the planting palette that you put there are plants that are going to be super happy in those conditions, like the Asclepia incarnata, which is this picture you can see the happy bee there or um, I don't know the hibiscus we, we have a beautiful hibiscus mosquitoes that you know takes a lot of water or some of our rushes like the juncus effusus right or sometimes we do berms right and a berm is just a a little I don't know how to explain it without you know like a little mountain just you know you shape the ground uh, and you do a little, um, in, you know, sort of a little um, berm, you know, what a berm is. And what a, the berm does is to redirect the water, right? And sometimes we put many different berms and we do overflow in the berms. Or you could consider a rain garden as well. And a rain garden, if you have the right conditions, if you have a, a soil that percolates well, uh, that rain garden could be not only to receive the water from your downspouts, but also to receive the water from, from your neighbor's um, yard and your neighbor's downspout. But you need to you know, try and do the, the right calculations and the right test before you commit to a rain garden. And everything, everything is online. You, you have a lot of information online to, to you know, you know, make you do these, these systems um, and you know, make them successful. I cannot hear you, Nancy. You're muted. Excuse me. Um, somebody's asked, is the only option for high groundwater to regrade and add soil? Uh, for a, for a, a, sorry, sorry, for a water, for a underwater that is for a water table? For high grade. For high, high ground grade. water, high, high ground water. No, me. no, 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 no. When you are talking about regrading and when you are talking about adding soil, you are talking about modifying the existing conditions. And that's what we don't want to do. We have to assess the conditions. We have to learn the conditions that we have. And then we have to find plants that are happy in those conditions. And we can only add, you know, we can only add planting of those conditions in that area. That is the formula for success. And that's what we do professionally. We, the, the old fashioned way of trying to fix and trying to bring lots of of you know, organic material and try to add fertilizers and try to use chemical that is old fashioned, that is gone and we have to move forward. You have to um, assess your conditions, you have to learn your conditions. And an advantage that the homeowner has is that the homeowner is there all the time. So you could possibly take a whole year to study your condition take pictures, take notes, learn what happened everywhere. This is an advantage that you have that we don't have. Usually we have one or two meetings before we have to go into design mode. So, so again, learn your conditions, mat match the plans to that, those conditions. Okay, just a few more minutes. Um, somebody wanted a suggestion for a tree that would serve as a, a screen in a wet, shady area up to 50 or 60 feet tall, equally wide. <laughs> well, may order. yeah, maybe you can consider, uh, maybe you can consider a birch tree. Um, the Betula nigra, it's a tree that is native um, to our area. It can certainly get to be, I think, 60 feet or something like that. Uh, it has a gorgeous bark. I have one in my rain garden. It has this beautiful papery bark. Sometimes you can get that tree that is, um, it has multiple trunks. Sometimes it's a single trunk. 
and it's a lovely feature. It, uh, it is actually a deciduous tree, so it will lose its leaves in the winter time. Um, so you won't have the privacy in the winter, but in the growing season, it's beautiful and the bark is just stunning. Um, there is also the wax myrtle or Morella serifera. If you have at least partial sun, it is an evergreen and native um, shrub, and it produces these beautiful light blueberries that birds love. And that's one that we've been using um, quite often, especially when we have at least, you know, three or four hours of, of sun. Um, there is also the Viburnum nudum that takes water, um, but that's more of a shrub, um, but it can get to be maybe 15, 16 uh, feet tall. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, do you have any more suggestions on a rain garden about what size somebody would need? to be effective. Right, right. So this is nothing that we could do, you know, in a 30 second answer. Um, I, I believe Fairfax County has a booklet on rain gardens. I mean, it's not rocket science, but you, you do need to make your calculations. Not only you, you need to know the kind of soil that you have, and the permeability of the soil, but you have to calculate, for example, the size of impermeable surfaces that will drain into that um, rain garden, the, the size of semi-permeable surfaces, and roughly uh, do calculation of the deep, different depths of the rain garden because the, the rain garden has different depth, right? It has gravel, it, ha it has river rocks, it has... Um, engineer soil and then you do your planting and then you do your mulch um, so i would suggest um, i think um, Anne arundel um, county in um, maryland has a wonderful um, online um, booklet on rain gardens that you know is a, okay, is a wonderful resource just about out of time now i want to thank you for a wonderful presentation thank you for all your questions i'm sorry we didn't get to them um, perhaps we can get back to you by email if we have your email. Um, and I think at the end we'll we'll be I'll, I'll be available at the very end. Oh, at, she is at, going to be available. Noon, yeah. And you see Alyssa's email address there, info at nativeplantld.com. So thank you again very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey. Uh, so for those of you in this session, uh, it'll be a five-minute break, uh, and you'll you don't have to do anything uh, and then I'm going to do my best to set up the second sessions uh, hopefully in a different way so that everybody can pick their own room a little bit more easily. So we'll start.